We have been studying a little bit about each of the 12 disciples and key characteristics in their lives, good and bad, that perhaps we can identify. I don't know if by now you've picked out one that says, hey, I identify with that guy more than anybody else. Well, we're not even halfway there yet, but this latter half of the number, of, we're not halfway, but the latter half, it's going to be fairly quickly because the last four, there's virtually nothing in Scripture about. So for that reason, there's just not a whole lot to say as far as other than just general statements based on the general assessment of what the disciples did. But here in chapter 10 of Matthew, verse 1, it says, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, disciple being a student, a follower, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the name of the twelve apostles, the disciple is a student, they're called in. A an apostle is the sent out ones, those sent out to proclaim. There are these, the first or the chief, Protos, is Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Lebaeus, whose surname is Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. So as we look at this, we're going to look at John during this hour. We see John is the last of the four in group number one. We see it's divided in three groups. In all four lists, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the book of Acts, we will always see the first four names listed together. Not always in that order, but Peter will always be the first. He is the recognized leader of the group of 12. He's also the recognized leader of group just the group one of four. So he is the chief. He is the first in hierarchy among the disciples and apostles. He is recognized so by the other gospels as well. Group number two is always led by Philip. In every list, he is listed fifth. And of course, the other three names may change order, but they are always associated as that group of four. And then James, the son of Alphaeus, he is always listed ninth as the, seemingly the leader of group number four. And Judas Iscariot is always listed last. As, and always identified as the one who betrayed the Lord. Of course, Acts chapter, Acts chapter 1 does not list him. Why? Well, he had already committed suicide by that point. He had taken his life. So as we look at these, you know, Peter, he was that, he was that one that always was speaking before he thought. He seemed to be called down here and there, but... Yet he was the leader. He was out there in front, and others kind of stood back and let him take the lightning bolts, you know, for saying the wrong thing or the praise for saying the right thing. He was always wanted to be first in action. He always wanted to be first in seemingly everything that came up. And that was just part of him. He was a natural leader. And then there's Andrew, his brother, who tended to follow. Andrew, of these first four, was the, the least of the four, it seemed like, but he was the one always leading people to Christ. He was never seen as a public speaker, never speaking to the masses throughout all of the scriptures. Now, later in his life and ministry, most likely he did, but we don't see that in the Gospels or in the book of Acts. James, the son of Zebedee. James is the son of thunder. That is... One who is kind of loud, he, is, he speaks boldly, they're ambitious, and of course his John, also son of Zebedee, they're brothers, and he also, he, Jesus nicknamed both of them the sons of thunder. And we don't always see that of the apostle John. Now John, he was, he's often depicted as this uh, meek, mild, weak, some depictions I've seen of him in some stained glass windows or paintings, he, he almost seems effeminate and always laying there kind of on Jesus' breast and looking up with those dove eyes into his face. And it, it, It's just, that's not John. John, yes, he was the, the beloved disciple. That's the, the title of the message this morning, John the Beloved Disciple. And we'll get to that as to the significance of that. 
But he was also the son of thunder. He was ambitious. He was there with James when they talked their mother into asking Jesus, we want the two thrones, one on the right hand, one on the left hand side. He was the one when, that Jesus said, can you drink the cup and be baptized with the baptism wherewith I am baptized? In other words, can you suffer the cost that is going to be demanded for those who take those two thrones? Oh, Lord, we're able. John was in among those as well. And we see him also when the Samaritans refused service and refused to receive them for that overnight stay there in the village of Samaria. When they said, you can't stay here, you're headed to Jerusalem to worship. They don't let us worship there, so you can't stay here. So James and John says, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven like Elijah did and burn them up? Jesus says, you, you don't know what manner of spirit you have. He says, this is not the day. That was in the day of Elijah. They had just seen Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. They said, well, that's what Elijah did. No, that's not the We didn't come to destroy men's lives. We came to save them. And that's, that, that was the spirit. That is why he came the first time, to seek and to save that which was lost. And they didn't quite grasp the meaning of all that. So in, in, in essence, we could say this. Ditto to all of what we said about James applying to John. And we're not going to re-preach that same message from last week because you can go back and listen to it because those two were generally together. Always part of that group of inner three, Peter, James, and John. Often James and John are seen together. Now John will be often paired with Peter or others, but generally he is near Jesus, almost always. And we'll see that about him as well. Well, he definitely is a son of thunder, but he was a powerful and impactful uh, apostle in the first century. He's the second disciple to be called to begin to follow Jesus there in John chapter 1, verses 35 and following. He's the last of the twelve to die for the cause of Christ. He was the last one. The first was James. We saw that last week. He was the first among the apostles to die, being martyred, and John was the last. Now you say, we thought John died of old age. He did, but yet he is also considered martyred because from what tradition and historians tell us, they tried to martyr him, but the Lord preserved his life. The Lord was not finished with him. And therefore, even though he did not die, he ended up dying of old age as far as we can tell around the age close to 100 years of age. But he is still considered a martyr among those. He was instrumental in leading and the establishing of the local church there in the first century. And he was a key and prolific writer of the New Testament. He wrote five books in the New Testament, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. Now we know that the Gospel of John comes up in the beginning of the New Testament. But most likely, it was written between the year 85 and 90, which was decades after the, the previous Gospels had been written. In fact, these five books he wrote are likely the last five books of the Bible to be written. And they're written by the Apostle John. So as we examine, while James, there's not a whole lot you can come to, to know about him. There's only one time he is singled out alone in the scriptures, and that is his death in Acts chapter 12. Now that can't be said of John. John, through the examination of his writings and what the others said about him and all this, we can know a host of details about him that we do not have time to go through and list all of them today. But I want to look at a few things and pull these out. We have studied the Gospel of John, we've studied 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and we've studied the book of Revelation. Now there's a course that's often done on master's level or doctoral levels in theology studies. It's called Johannine Theology or the Johannine Epistles. That's the writings of John and you examine those together and catch the depiction of Christ and other doctrines in his writings. That would take a very long time to do as well. But I do want to pull out just a few things that it, as we add to what we already know about him based on our study of James last week, I want to look at the younger John. 
the, the disciple John in the earlier stages, and then, of course, by the time of the crucifixion, John was one of the few that was already beginning to get the picture of who Jesus was and what he wanted to accomplish in their lives. He wasn't yet perfect, but yet he seemed to be grasping that. If we look, let's, let's turn and... Uh, Look, if you will, at uh, Matthew chapter 20. Well, we don't have to read it again. We read it last time. But we see the young John. I want you to contrast him. Young John there in Matthew 20, he's the one that he's ambitious. They want those two thrones, one on the right and left side. And, of course, Mrs. Ebedee, she came and she thought her sons were worthy of that. Hey, our sons are special. They're gifted. Isn't that what all parents say about their sons? Our, our, our kids, they, they should have those positions. Well, they came in, in, in Mark chapter 9. Jesus asked them, we'll see this later on, says, what were you arguing about in the way? And he knew what they were arguing about. They are arguing about who's going to be the greatest. And John seemed to have gotten convicted over that. But there's, turn with me to Mark 9. This is the one event that's not, it is not uh, brought out in James's study. But it's brought out in the life of John. It's the only time in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that we find John speaking by himself. All the other times he's with someone else or he's paired with someone else and he's associated with someone else in whatever action or speech there is. But this is the one time in these three synoptic gospels that we have him isolated. Well, in verses 30 and 31, Jesus was preparing them for his death. Verse 31 says, For he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. So this, this goes back to that thing. You know how a, a teacher sometimes will ask the class now, do you understand that? They'll all nod their heads even though they didn't get it. Why? Because we're afraid to ask. We're afraid, and we'll see that in, in Philip's life in the next hour. But here in verse 33, it says, And he, he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, What was it ye disputed among yourselves by the way? And they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve and said unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be the last of all and servant of all. And he took, up, took a child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive one of, of such children in my name receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me, but him that sent me. And John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we f he followed, followeth not us, and we forbade him, because he followeth not us. Now stop there for a moment. John, they're, they're going along, they see this guy. He's not one of their group, not one of the twelve, and not one of the, the larger group that were also considered disciples, not the apostles, but the disciples. But he said, they're not part of our team, Lord, and they're out there casting out demons in your name. And we said they had to stop it. Hey, well, we've got the corner on this market of casting out demons and healing these ailments. And, and this was kind of, wasn't it the, we see that the same reaction of the disciples of John. They went to John the Baptist and said, John, this Jesus and his, they're drawing bigger crowds than we are. They're doing the same things. They're baptizing. And he said, so what? That's what it's about. Sometimes we get that sectarian thing that if you're not part of our little group, then you're not part of it. You're not real. You're not right. I think we're going to be surprised when we get to heaven. I think we'll be surprised who will be there. Perhaps people we thought would never make it will be there because they had the simplicity of trusting Jesus as their Savior. They didn't understand all the theology and perhaps lived a life of error theologically, but they had a sincere confession of faith. And I believe, on the other hand, there are going to be some people that we were sure were going to be there that perhaps were just living that lie of being in church, being 
living, going through the motions, but never truly knowing Jesus as their Savior. Well, John said, look, they're not part of us, so we told them they couldn't be doing that. And Jesus corrects them and says, forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he, for he that is not against us is on our part. You know, if he's doing the same work and he's proclaiming the kingdom of God and he's doing things in the name of Jesus, then why are you stopping him? Let him go. Our desire is to win the loss is not so much that we get the credit for it. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. But John was somewhat sectarian in that sense. That means that if, you're, if you don't follow with us, then you're not of us and you can't do what we do. Well, that's not the way it works. We don't have the corner on the market of witnessing and evangelizing, and we need to encourage those who will do it. He could also be unforgiving, as we already commented and we saw last time, in that group there at the Samaritan village who wouldn't receive them. They wanted to just bring fire down and consume them. Well, that's the old, younger John as the disciple. Now, we will see a little bit of a change in him as we approach the crucifixion. Yes, he fled in the garden when Jesus was arrested, but he is very soon back in line with Jesus because when Jesus was taken in, into the high priest's house, into his estate there, John was right there with them. He went in because they knew him. The high priest knew John. Now, Peter had to wait outside, and then John comes back and talks to the girl at the gate, and she lets Peter in too. So of the disciples, those two even went while he was in the process of being tried and then later taken to be crucified. So we see that he begins to see a difference. He begins to behave slightly differently toward the end of that time. But now we're going to jump forward. As we look into the writings of John, we jump forward to the end of the first century. All the other apostles have already been killed, martyred for the cause of Christ. All the other books of the New Testament have already been written. And John is going to come back, and with the benefit of all that has already been written, he's going to, the Lord's going to use him to kind of fill in the blanks of areas that were not mentioned or things like that. In fact, as we look at his writings, we're going to find out they're the most unique of all the New Testament writers. But first, let's see his humility. In, in the Gospel of John, and we're, we're not going to read it, but I, I'll remind you of something we studied while we did go through it. John never mentions his name one time. Now imagine this. Lord, we are your disciples. We're willing, we want to do as Elijah did and rain fire down out of heaven on the people. We want the thrones, one on the right hand and one on the left hand. Now that speaks of an ambitious person who wants recognition, does it not? By the end of his life, John was a little more concerned with not obtaining that throne, but being worthy of that throne. And that should be our attitude. Not so much that we want at any cost to have that reward, but being worthy of deserving that reward. Which comes from faithfulness and love for the Lord. But you say... John calls himself, and he never refers to him by name, but he calls himself, he's the beloved disciple. Growing up, did you ever have a sibling or somebody who, who told you that, oh, they love me more than they love you? They don't love you as much as they do me. My brothers and sisters, they used to tell me, says, oh, we found you. You're not really part of the family. They found you in a trash can. <laughs> of course, we knew better, but you know, it's still just that kind of rivalry. And some have suggested that, well, John, he's kind of, you know, presumptuous. Say, I'm the one, I'm the beloved disciple, the one that Jesus loved. But folks, I do not believe that by the time he comes to his 90s, and he's looking back through all those years of faithful service and persecution, and he becomes one of the patriarchs, literally, of the church, one of the key leaders. He is not sitting there writing that in an arrogant, selfish way that, hey, I was the beloved disciple. 
fact, I believe he was writing it more like he did the book of Revelation. And which he says, and I, John, I saw this. And I, John, I was taken up into the, the heaven. And I, John, saw the new Jerusalem. He was not saying I, John, because he wanted recognition. He was saying, the Lord showed it to me, John. I don't deserve that. He was shocked that he would have been one of the ones chosen for this. And I believe that's why he did not mention his name in the gospel. Not one time. There are times that it becomes almost obscure because of the way he just very subtly puts it there. And if you're not careful to read, you'll miss it altogether. He didn't draw attention to himself. But that leads us to believe that when he said the beloved disciple, it's, that's the only claim I have. And folks, is that not the only claim you and I have? That he loved us. He didn't love us because we first loved him. We love him because he first loved us. And he loved us while we were yet sinners. And we're here today because of that love, because of that grace, and because of that mercy. So he goes from being that ambitious young John to that humble elder John. He went from being that sectarian to being balanced Toward the end of his life. There are three key themes as you study the books of, of John. And I'm going, to kind of, I'm going to focus on two. But there are three that kind of jump out. One is love. The second is truth. And the third is witness. Love, truth, and witness. Now, there are other themes. But these three jump out of his writings. And I think there's a reason for it. Now remember, here's that boisterous, ambitious, sometimes selfish, sectarian, young John. And now, later in life, as he writes these books, totally different attitude, totally different approach. He had seen Jesus, he had been loved by Jesus, and he learned to love as Jesus loved. They say that in his last years... This was, I think it's, I don't know if it's the Fox's Book of Martyrs. But it, some of the historians say that he had to be carried into the church during those last years in his last days. But there's one phrase constantly on his lips is, my little children love one another. My little children love one another. And that was the theme of his writings, the theme of his life. Well, if you re go through, and I'm just going to read a sampling of those verses say John 13 14 if then your Lord and master have washed your feet ye also ought to wash one another's feet a, a servant is one who's demonstrating love John 15 12 this is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you Jesus being the example in 1st John 2 verses 9 through 11 he said, he that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in the darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth, because the darkness hath blinded his eyes. 1 John three ten and 11. And this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whoso doeth not the righteousness, not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. 1 John three sixteen through 18. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And you can go on, 1 John 4, 7 through 12, the same thing. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love, and he goes on. Love is a key theme. You claim to be a Christian, you should be marked by love. In fact, that is one of the first fruits of the Spirit, that he will create in you love, joy, peace. You claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You claim to be a child of God. There should be that love. And not the selfish love. The agape love. Well not just love but 
This is one of the big problems. And of all the things we learned about John, this is one that I wish you would grasp. That you will take out of here because the day we are living in, it has been going on for decades, but the day we're living in is getting to the point that it has become part of even what was conservative churches. And that is the concept that, well, brother, we're supposed to love everybody. We love each other. We love everybody. We love the lost. And so we need to just put aside some of these doctrines that divide and they upset people and they cause more fights than they do anything else. And we just need to put that aside. John, God says in the book of John, you've you got to love one another. And so for the sake of love, we sacrifice truth. But it's interesting that in that same apostle, the beloved apostle, you will find both of those as major themes. In fact, you cannot have one without the other. You can't have love without truth, and you cannot have truth without love. You have to have both. So the idea that, okay, we're going to set aside these doctrinal issues for the sake of loving them and having fellowship is wrong. And no one points that out more so than John does. In fact, he is cut and dried. It's light and darkness. It's life and death. It's black and white with John, always through his gospel and always through his epistles. In fact, look at the themes, light and darkness, life and death, kingdom of God, kingdom of the devil, children of God, children of the devil, judge of right, judgment of righteousness and judgment of the wicked, the right, resurrection of life, in the resurrection to death or damnation. To receive Christ or reject Christ, the fruitfulness versus fruitlessness, obedience versus disobedience, love and hatred, truth and error. He always put those two diametrically opposed. We cannot, for the sake of love, tolerate error. And he deals with those topics. Well, if you look at what he says about the truth here, as it goes, so the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 14. 1, 17, the, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John 3, 21, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. In chapter 4, with the Samaritan woman, he says, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Oh, we just come to worship the Lord, but yet we do it in a way that dishonors the Lord. In ways that does not reflect the truth of the Lord. Then that is not worship of the Lord. No matter how sincere our motives are, if we do it in a worldly way, if we do it in a way that displeases or violates the principles of the Lord, it is not worship. Oh, but all that matters is the motive in the heart. No. There are points when truth comes into play. You can be sincerely wrong. And I believe there are examples in Scripture where we see people that were, and some of them ended tragically. Well, Jesus, John 14, 6, Jesus, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Then over in 1 John, it says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And he goes on, the, the book of 2 John, he takes the first half of the book and says to the, the elect lady, he says, I thank God that your children are walking in the truth. Then he takes verses 7 to 11 of that one chapter epistle, and he says, but be careful. There are those that are coming to deceive you. And then at the end he says, look, if, the, if anybody comes to your church meeting, to your house, and they bring not the doctrine of Christ, says, you don't let them in. You don't receive them. Don't bid them Godspeed. You do not tolerate error in your worship and teaching. Truth and love go hand in hand. In fact, I like what one man said. He said, 
zeal for truth must be balanced by the love for people. I believe this comes from that book, The Twelve Ordinary Men by MacArthur. It says, zeal for truth must be balanced by love for people. Truth without love has no decency, it's just brutality. We beat them over the head with the truth, but we have no love for them. On the other hand, love without truth has no character, and it's just hypocrisy. And that's exactly what it is. You have to have both of those elements. And by the way, if you bring in that other theme of witness, which I would like to take some time and develop that maybe at another time. If you take the two, our love will motivate us to take the truth and share that through our witness to others. The truth will burden us because of love to witness to others. And when we go to witness, it will be based upon the truth. Now you say, well, you know, I'd like to witness to so-and-so, and I want to talk to them about their life, but I'm afraid I'm going to hurt them. I'm afraid I'm going to offend them, and I'm afraid they'll get upset with me. Well, true love tells someone what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. You can say, well, I don't want to hurt their feelings, and they will go with unhurt feelings straight into the lake of fire. The, the, the doctrine of sin, it hurts. But it's necessary because until we realize we're sinners and we receive Jesus Christ, we are on a way to Christless eternity. And the world around us is doing it. Some of our loved ones are doing that today. Well, we see John the theologian. As we said, he, he's a third most prolific writer. Luke is number one, and then Paul, I believe, is number two. And then John is the third of the key writers in the, in the New Testament. 92% of his writings in the Gospel of John are, are unique. The other three Gospels don't touch it. That's not true. The next closest is, I think, 59%. But 92% of his is unique. He deals with Jesus as God. He deals with his deity. And no parables in the book of John. But he has seven miracles, five of which are not mentioned in the other Gospels. So he has a lot of very unique... and. After all those years and all the other writings, he, the Spirit used him to kind of fill in some gaps that were yet unclear. The titles he gives to Jesus, he is the Word, the Lamb of God, the Messiah, the Son of God, the King of Israel, the, the Savior of the world. He is Lord, he is God. He attests the deity of Christ through the I Am statements. I am the door, I am, and he goes through those many different I Am statements. He's, he brings the deepest theological truth. Things that the others, while the others have much of that, John is unique in the approach and the content that he brings out. And then, of course, the love, John 3, 16. He can summarize all the plan, the redemptive plan of God in one verse and in one person. Clearer than any other passage of scripture. And then in 1 John, he gives us the assurance of salvation. How do you know that you know him as your Savior? Because there were those that were questioning that. He said, the way you know, and he goes through those five chapters of 1 John and tells us how we can know for sure that we know Jesus as our Savior. So he's, he's a theologian, but he's also an adoptive son. In a sense, by the time Jesus came to the point of the cross and as he hung there on that cross, You'll recall that right down there near the front was John and Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now you can think, well, maybe Peter would have been a better choice. Maybe one of the other, maybe Andrew would be a better choice to take care of the mother of Jesus. See, that was one of the responses. Apparently Joseph at this point is not alive. So he being the eldest son would have had the priority and the responsibility for his mom. And there as he is agonizing on that cross, he is still looking to fulfill that responsibility. And he says to John, he says, behold your mother, mother, woman, behold your son. Now he had gained the confidence and the devotion and the love for Christ so much so that he received that great responsibility. Tradition says, one writer said that he never left Jerusalem until she passed away. Whether or not when he went to the church at Ephesus she was still alive, I don't know. But some say that he never left there until she had already passed. 
But what a devotion. What a love. In John 18, we saw that even as he was being tried, he, though he fled in the garden, he was still going and finding out what was happening with his master. Well, we can also look at John the pastor. We did this in the book of Revelation. He was a shepherd. In Revelation chapters 2 and 3, he writes that letter, first of all, to the church of Ephesus where he was pastor, and from there he was martyred. And they tried to kill him from what historians tell us. But it didn't take, and so he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos to work in the mines, the stone mines. And there he was given that vision, but as he writes, he writes to that church at Ephesus where he was pastor. And then the other six churches, it is believed that that church was instrumental in starting those other six, and he writes to each of those as well. And with the pastor's heart, giving them the words of Christ and the admonition of the Lord Jesus. He was a pastor, a shepherd. But then, in conclusion, we see at the end of his life, he, he lived longer than any of the other apostles. Like I said, it's, some believe he may have been even over 100, but near 100 at least. Domitian, he had ordered his exile to Rome, tried to kill him. One of the accounts says that they were going to kill him by putting him in a cauldron of boiling oil. And that didn't work. It, he, it did him no harm. So they exiled him to the Isle of Patmos, where he remained until Domitian was no longer emperor. And uh, Nerva came in as emperor. And he recalled John. But this was in his latter days, and he was very weak. And in those final days, Jerome, in his commentary on Galatians, says he was so frail in the final days that he had to be carried into the church. One phrase constantly on his lips my little children love one another. When asked why he always said this, he responded, it is the Lord's command. And if this alone be done, it is enough. Do we know Christ that way? To where the, the key emphases are on love and truth and sharing that love and truth with those who don't know. Do we mature that way in our Christian life? Or yes, when we're younger in the Lord, we don't have that maturity. But as we spend time with Jesus, those few years that they spent with Jesus, they began to adopt his love. They began to adopt his meekness. Rather than a son of thunder, he becomes a beloved disciple. And as we age, we should become more and more like Christ, where as people look to us and as other younger believers look to us, our example helps them in their spiritual lives. This is why community life in a church is so important. Older believers who have grown and matured in Christ are setting examples and encouraging and exhorting younger believers to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. What an apostle. Brother Dusty in his final days, I remember when COVID set in and as it prolonged the shutdowns and everything else, we would talk on the phone and he'd say, Brother Ken, I'm worried about the church. Not just ours, but other churches. He said, people are getting out of the habit of going to church. They're getting out of the habit of getting into the word of God, of fellowship. And he said, it's not good. I'm worried. Over and over, we would talk during those times. And as he lay there on his deathbed, it turns out, there at Montgomery Regional Hospital. And the last two conversations we had, even the one when he was under the effects of the morphine, he would, he would, he would doze off a little bit in mid-sentence. And then he'd wake up and he'd apologize and keep talking. The same sentence he was talking about when he dozed off a few minutes earlier. But he's worried about others. He's worried about the church. How is so and so? How is so and so? He's worried about the lost. Reminds you a little bit of the Apostle John, doesn't it? I think we need to be, all of us need to develop a little more of those fruits. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this life, for this example, and Lord, for this exhortation that, yes, we cannot serve you and claim to be a child of yours without love. But Lord, that love is never at the expense of your truth because you are the truth. 
Lord, help us to balance those two things, to speak the truth as we witness, but to do so in love, tempered by that love and grace that you have bestowed to us through our faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray if someone doesn't know Christ, that they would see the love of God here and turn to him immediately because you love them enough to give your only son that they might have everlasting life. Apply your words to our hearts, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.